were so special this morning as well, and and I this needs to be returned to because the audience is fluid, and we have some people sometimes, some people other times. Is that Julie Sheik? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to do this too. Uh, with Jonathan is uh, Julie Hayden from Fox News, and there's a weird story that's starting to spin around about um, Pat Sullivan and Columbine. Uh, Julie, thanks. Good morning. Welcome back to the show. Hey, good morning, Peter. And I know you and Chuck will be hosting the morning show on 850 KOA tomorrow morning, you and Chuck Bonnewell, and I know this will be part of what you say. John, thank you for coming back, and good morning. Thank you again. All right, so, Julie, what is this bizarre Columbine connection? Well, you know, I don't want to talk a lot about it because we're still kind of working on it, and I haven't, to be honest, verified things, um, everything. But I was contacted by the parents of one of the Columbine survivors, uh, but one of them was injured pretty severely. And people may remember the Columbine, there was an 11,000-page report. And on one of the pages in the report, and I don't know, Jonathan, I was actually going to talk to you about it, so weigh in if you've heard about this. There is a picture that uh, apparently Eric Harris drew, and it's part of the official Columbine report. I know exactly what you're talking about. (laughs) Okay. The day that he and um, Klebold were were busted for the van vandalism. And in this diagram that he drew, he shows essentially one of them um, on all fours and a figure wearing a badge, a very clear badge, standing behind them in a position sex, uh, clearly suggesting sexual assault. And right. um, mm-hmm. there is um, a lot, apparently there was talk during some of the, the trial. Remember, remember the families sure. sued the, the, the families, and some of this, I think, was um, has been sealed. A lot of it, I think, actually has been sealed. But apparently there was talk that Harris and Klebold described this arrest, which is really simply for it was bad, but it was just for vandalism, described this arrest as being hugely traumatic. They had to go into anger management. Um, and there are some who feel that the teen's reaction to this fan arrest was way out of proportion to a simple, and particularly because it wasn't really their first contact with law enforcement, there, you know, was way out of proportion to the seriousness of the crime, that they were much more traumatized than you would have thought they would have been. And the family of the Columbine survivor that contacted me said that they had, um, at, when this came out and they saw this this picture, um, had some personal contact and, and I think felt like they had personal connections with Pat Sullivan and asked him to look into it and then never, ever, ever heard back from him. Um, I don't think they're suggesting that Pat Sullivan was in, was the person there. It was, it was Jefferson County law enforcement officers. But I think in light of what has come out about Pat Sullivan, I think, you know, their position is, well, we now know why he probably never looked into it. Um, even maybe he wouldn't have anyway. But, um, but there's that. And then, uh, you know, and also I think it sort of changes to a certain extent the way we look at law enforcement a little bit. I mean, who would have thought Pat Sullivan, you know? And if this is the case, Peter, I think, I mean, it really, if this is true, um, and there is a lot of debate about whether it is or it is, the picture is true. Sure. No, I, 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 I've looked at everything since hearing from people about the story, and I heard about it yesterday afternoon. Uh, again, if you're just joining us, 9 after the hour, KHAL Radio, Jonathan Elanoff, investigator, Julie Hayden, of course, investigative reporter for Fox. And this story began yesterday. Is there some sort of a bizarre Columbine connection into Pat Sullivan? Well, and, and sort of, I mean, I think if what this family is saying is true, I think there's clearly a connection, not so much to Pat Sullivan um, and anything to do with Columbine, but I think, you know, him not looking into it, if there really was a sex assault on, on Harris or Klebold by one of the officers involved in making this an arrest, um, and then, then it kind of, I think, puts a lot of their comments and their writings into an entirely new perspective and, frankly, could shift the entire way we as a nation look at Columbine. Forever it's been thought of, frankly, as, as the school's fault yeah. for not protecting the boys from bullying and things like that. Well, this would shift it onto much more broadly onto the shoulder of, shoulders of potential law enforcement. If these boys were acting in part out of vengeance or trauma or anger, which is pretty common at having been sexually assaulted during the course of an arrest, I mean, that changes, I, to me at least, I think that would significantly shift the way we view Columbine. Jonathan. 
Yeah, that's uh, right on, spot on, actually, to what I had come across with, uh, or excuse me, across with uh, people that gave me information. I found um, people were claiming that, yes, there was a, an, uh, an alleged officer, possibly, or at least somebody dressed with a badge that they believed this image depict, and the image depict, um, right, uh, um, you know, um, anal sex, I guess is the term, or uh, sodomy. Right. I don't know if that's a lot to be said. You're probably going to have to bleed me on that. But I don't know. I, I When I looked at the drawing, I was pre- it was pretty clear to me that, oh, okay, that's, that's someone being raped. And it was three what looks like police cars drawn um, pulled up what would be um, a, along a fence. And um, this was a document that Jeffco put in their massive um, uh, stack of papers released, and this was drawn by, and I forget which one either, Eric. I think it's Harris. Is what, okay. uh, what, what, the, the, the picture that I saw um, and the description that goes with it along with the document, mean, you know, you can look at it. Shoot, you want me to tell you what page, Peter? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to put it up on the website here in just a second. Oh, so. okay, so you already know. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, we're you, gonna... can look, you can look at it, and, um, you know, it's so I guess the question becomes, um, what was ever done about that? Sure. It, you know what I mean? It's like clearly, I think we all understand why Pat Sullivan wasn't going to look into it. Um, but what did Jeffco ever do? And apologies, the, the baby is here. But I mean, what did Jeffco ever do about it? And I know all along from the beginning, and Peter, you know this, there have been a lot of questions about the way from the from the first response on to the way that the whole Columbine situation was handled. I know we tried um, repeatedly back in the day when I was over at Channel 7 to talk to the uh, investigator who handled some of those, not the Columbine stuff, but who handled some of those earlier law enforcement contacts with Harrison people who police went on to use as informants um, investigating some kind of computer stuff going on at the high school. Um, but And he disappeared. I mean, we could never, we, well, we traced him, but he left the state, would never return phone calls, would never answer any questions at all um, it's, about it's a, those yeah. early investigations. You know, when I first heard this yesterday afternoon from a source other than you two guys, and I went, and we went and looked, and when we hit hold here uh, for the pause, Sheik will talk to you guys, and we'll get that picture up on the uh, on, on our website so people can see it. What struck me, Julie, is, I mean, I've had so many conversations with, men and women in law enforcement, away from, obviously, all of this, who need anonymity to speak, and I, I, obviously, but you you think about this, and you're bright, and John's bright, and you guys have lived this. So we know the timeline. Um, uh, Carol Chambers smartly gets herself out of this because no matter what, it's going to have a bad ending for her, and she doesn't want this blowing back on her. So she says, look, let the chips fall where they may, and I really admire her for that. So then... Governor John Hickenlooper, on January the 18th, 2012, signs an executive order, and that executive order gives this to John Southers. Southers forms a task force. On that task force, we believe, are 22 law enforcement officers and all the extra cops that they need when they need them. It is a task force of Arapahoe County Sheriffs, Aurora Police Department, Colorado Bureau of Investigation, Denver Police, FBI, Jefferson County Sheriff's Task Force, and South Metro Drug Task Force. Now, 22 full-time officers, as many part-time as they need. They do a 60-plus day investigation, spend millions of dollars, and come back with nothing. I don't believe it. I throw the BS flag right at all of it. But at the same time, and I'm going to set a question up when you two come back, and you're going to tell the sheik off here about that page. But what I think is fascinating is I talked to a couple of narcotics cops yesterday, and they said if they wanted to get Pat, they would have gotten Pat. Jonathan believes it was predestined how the bust went down. But all they would have to do, they got these young prostitutes, they, they had them flipped. All they had to do is keep setting Pat up for buys, just like they would have done to a guy in the hood, like they'd have done to a guy in South Broadway, like they'd have done anywhere. You make a small buy, you make a bigger buy, you befriend the guy, you make even bigger buys, and then you make the big buy, and then you get everybody involved in the network. They chose not to do it that way. They chose to take him down with this sick individual in a room with two other guys. Now, why didn't they narc him out like they would anybody else? And they didn't do that. And these guys said they led them to believe that they were they well in intention plan never to have a trial that would be full blown or hammer hand, hand, hammer him with a with a big beef. Interesting stuff, isn't it, guys? 
I'll t- I, yes, it is interesting. And I'll tell you this. Um, I looked at a lot of documents, actually about a, a giant box of documents that somebody handed me. And I looked into what people were saying about, uh, you know, the failed parts of this investigation that they saw where charges should have been brought up, where they weren't, how this should have gone down, where, you know, they their could've. protocols and stuff like that. They could have. With the South Metro Task Force, all these other agencies, they could have taken him down like they would take anybody else down. They chose not to. Put you both on hold. Hang on a second. Julie Hayden, Jonathan Elinoff, Sheik, 16 after the R of 8, 816, KHL Radio, Traffic, here's Susan. All right, it's 23 minutes after the R of 8, 823. Uh, that page from the Columbine... Report is now up on our website, khow.com. And does it depict someone with a star uh, standing behind someone down on all fours? Are they being violated sexually? And what does it mean? The drawings were that, of course, of Eric and Dylan. Uh, On line with us, Julie Hayden from Fox News and the Rev, her son. And also, (laughs) also with us, also with us, of course, Jonathan Elinoff. It is 630 KHOW. There's the man. He's his, yeah, there he is. We're going we're gonna to hand him to the dad. First, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I set that question up about whether, you know, would the cops and that, um, that many police officers and everything involved and millions of dollars spent coming back with nothing. And it's hard to believe it. And Jonathan and I spoke about it earlier. We had him, I'm having him back because of this, this picture with Columbine, but. Is it? We're looking at the at the report. Is it conceivable, Julie? You understand these documents, and Jonathan does. I would like to see the results of John Souther's Sullivan investigation. All the reports written by all these various law enforcement agencies. Well, that'd be beauty to see. Oh yeah, you know, and, and we I think intend if we haven't already to file a Freedom of Information Act request to see them, which I doubt we'll get. I, I doubt you'll get them also. Be, because well, a lot I think, of documents are missing too. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're, you're right, Peter. I know that there has been some speculation, and, and I think it's possible that maybe part, because, I mean, certainly something was going on back in chambers when they were having that lengthy discussion before they announced the plea agreement. Um, you know, where I said I afterwards, you know, where the judge comes out and says, no, I'm not bound to accept this, and, you know, there's been no problem. Would you do made. me a favor? Because a lot of people, we were speaking about it yesterday. We tried to get a hold of you. I know you were busy. How the deal goes down. Here's Judge, here's judge uh, Sylvester. Here is uh, the Attorney General. My authority. My, J- 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 he is John Souther's representative, and then the defense team for um, for Pat. Right. What happened? And, and so it's in court, and, and you know by now we've all heard it's it's the, the disposition hearing, and everybody has heard is and you know as expected that there was going to be a plea bargain in the case, and it's clear listening to the lawyers kind of sitting around in court before the whole thing starts that there is a plea agreement. They're talking about Pat signing documents and things like that, and stipulations and things. And and then they all go back into chambers, which is unusual. You, you know, mm-hmm. what is there to talk about in chambers? Mm-hmm. And I think particularly with plea deals, you know, where you want to make sure that the, there's no really even an appearance of something being worked out, so to speak. Um, and then about 20 minutes later, they come back, and, and then they do the deal. You know, they announce that they reached a plea agreement, and they say what it is. But the judge first starts out by explaining to Pat that he's not under any obligation to accept the plea agreement. Why wouldn't he? Nor- <laughs> well, yeah, and yeah. It, well, it's like, well, 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 wouldn't you have mentioned that to them in chambers then, you know? Yeah. And and uh, and that there's no promises been made, or if there have been made, he's not bound by any sentencing decisions either. Um, and it was just kind of, I, you know, like I said, I'm sitting there as a skeptical reporter thinking, well, what were you exchanging recipes back there then? I mean, sure. what were we all talking about for 20 minutes? Make, they were making a deal. Well, yeah, and, and now, and I... Personally, I think I think probably some things were being explained to the judge about why they reached this exactly. deal um, and the way they reached it um, that they didn't want to become public. Now, there has been speculation that it was discussing sensitive medical issues. You know, for instance, there's been a lot of rumors, and it certainly probably wouldn't surprise anyone if Pat mm-hmm. Sullivan was HIV positive. Um, but I'm not sure what that would have to do with anything. Jails accept HIV positive all, all the, the time. time. All the time. And, and there was some speculation. 